Hi, I'm Brian. Welcome to Worship with First Christian Church, located in historic downtown St. Joseph, Missouri, and wherever you are today. I'm wondering, what's on your playlist today? What tune have you been playing over and over on repeat? Do you do that too? I know that I do. I, I find a new favorite song and then I take it with me everywhere like a companion, like a close friend. And isn't that sort of what the life of faith is supposed to be too? We aren't meant to just worship on a Sunday or some other day of the week and leave it at that, but we're meant to sort of carry our faith life with us everywhere we go so that it is a, a melody that inspires our hearts and challenges us to be all that God has created us to be. Well, if you hadn't guessed it, music is our focus this month as we are purposely blurring the lines between sacred and secular tunes, seeking God's sacred presence in any of the music that widens our sense of compassion and our call and commitment to being people of peace and God's justice. So whatever song you are singing today, we are glad that you are with us for this short time together. Let's worship. Stirring us always to change 
beyond all models, words and imagery. You, fascinating mystery. August by Mary Oliver. Our neighbor, tall and blonde and vigorous, the mother of many children, is sick. We did not know she was sick, but she has come to the fence, walking like a woman who is balancing a sword inside of her body. And besides that, her long hair is gone. It is short and suddenly gray. I don't recognize her. It even occurs to me that it might be her mother. But it's her own laughter-edged voice, We've heard it for years over the hedges. All summer, the children, grown now and most of them with children of their own, come to visit. They swim, they go for long walks along the harbor, they make dinners for 12, for 15, for 20. In the early morning, two daughters come to the garden and slowly go through the precise and silent gestures of Tai Chi. They all smile. Their father smiles too and builds castles on the shore with the children and drives back to the city and drives back to the country. A carpenter is hired, a roof repaired, a porch rebuilt, everything that can be fixed. June, July, August. Every day we hear their laughter. I think of the painting by Van Gogh, the man in the chair, everything wrong and nowhere to go, his hands over his eyes. Your generous financial support not only allows us to continue our online ministry, but also supports our many efforts, which reach out to those in need. We invite you to share your financial gifts through the mail to the church office or via our quick and easy online Tithely Giving app. You'll find a link to the app in the description below today's video or on our website. Today's scripture reading is found in the teachings of the prophet Isaiah, a section of the text sometimes referred to as the future house of God. Reading from Isaiah 2, 1 through 5. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, come. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord.
You know, music has long been an important and integral part of Christian worship. For centuries, sacred music has been composed to help us learn more about the stories of Scripture, to deepen our understandings of the ways of Christ, and to explore what it means to be a person of faith. Many of us can probably name a favorite hymn, a favorite song that we sang around the campfire at church camp, or a favorite contemporary Christian song that speaks deeply to our hearts, that has opened our minds to a better way, and helped us understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And in recent years, more and more of us are discovering that secular songs often have the same ability to move us, to stir our hearts, to stir our minds, to help us understand these ways of Jesus that are so important to us, the ways of justice, the ways of peace, the ways of generosity, mercy, kindness, forgiveness. And so I'm excited that during this time while I'm away on sabbatical, you will be exploring together this sort of blurring of sacred and secular in music. Over the next several weeks, we will be inviting different guest speakers to share with us a so-called secular song that they have picked out that's been especially meaningful to them. And we've asked them to explore how this song helps to blur those lines between sacred and secular, what that song might say about their own journey of faith. In the fourth or fifth grade at Noyes Elementary School when our class was assigned a project. Research a famous person and give an oral presentation to the class. I chose Clara Barton to be my noteworthy person. I don't know how. I learned later in life that my mother always pushed me to study women in history, God love her, but how we came up with Clara I'll never know. According to the Red Cross website, she is one of the most honored women in American history. But I don't ever recall being interested in nursing or nonprofits or war. The story of me studying Clara Barton is a fabled Pittman story that pops up every once in a while at Christmas for some button bursting or jovial back smacking or eye rolling or <laughs> whatever reception the dueling pride and embarrassment of this story elicit at the moment. Because I was a child of Michael Pittman, esteemed theater and debate coach. And a child of Michael Pittman's doesn't just give an oral presentation on a historical figure. She becomes that historical figure. Yep, I went full on into the life of Clara Barton. I dressed in costume. We created a nuanced context of letter writing to my, Clara's, family at home, disclosing the realities of my labor and learning that the little Anne had done in studying me as a diligent fifth grader. I, as Clara, started the letter at my desk, quill in hand, I stood to recite the middle arcing narrative and ended my presentation back at my desk where I signed the letter, yours, Clara Barton. It was a masterpiece. My presentation was a family affair. I had a director, a costumer, an audience, a critic, and a little preteen, pre-diva attitude. Publicly appalled to have to take acting direction from her father, but privately thrilled to have so easily earned an A from her teacher. My career path was set, and it had absolutely nothing to do with Clara Barton. Why am I telling you this? The other formative memory I have of this class project was not only how hard my whole entire family worked to get me an A, not only how hard my parents worked to instill creativity and a love of rhetoric into a young child, not only how I was so difficult to direct that my father wouldn't cast me as the lead in one of his shows for another 11 years. No, the other formative memory I have of this class project is that it taught me about war. And it taught me that humans are ridiculous. Let me explain. 
As a child, I was, and still am in many cases, very naive, gullible, credulous, literal, I don't really know the right word to describe it, innocent maybe? Two plus two equaled five, still does, I think. My universe was the earth, the sun, nine planets, and the stars. The theory of relativity had yet to be introduced to young Anne. Time was normal, with the exception of the poor kids who in the fourth grade were only two years old because their birthdays fell on leap year. In elementary school in the 80s, gender consisted of boys and girls and tomboys and gay men who did theater. Life was not yet nuanced. For example, if you wanted to be a witch for Halloween, you put on a black dress and bought a pointy hat, grabbed a broom and painted your face and hands green. If you bought white paint instead and everyone thought you were a mime, that's on you. If you wanted to take first place at the National Spelling Bee, you memorized words, read books, studied the Spelling Bee booklet, over and over again, you spelled words at the dinner table, much to everyone's disgust or delight. So if you spelled a word wrong and were disqualified, that's on you. If you want to win at hide and seek, you find the best place in the house or yard and you secretly pray that your friends and family don't get bored looking for you. If you want to win the swimming game Marco Polo, you put on your best listening ears and don't forget to call fish out of water. If you want to win at Slapjack, you better get your hand poised and ready to slap. You dress and rehearse and play to win. So it was very startling to me to learn that there are nurses in war. I was further baffled that the nurses were allowed out onto the battlefield to tend to the wounded. And not only were they allowed to go out there, but the other side wasn't allowed to shoot them. Nurses were neutral, and it was against the rules or illegal or unethical or something to kill them or something. Let me explain. From day one, children are taught to compete, to do our best, to win, and if we're from the United States, we're taught to do that no matter what the cost or who we step on along the way. So imagine my surprise when I learned that there are rules in war. In war, we are literally killing one another, the worst of all things possible. How could there be rules? But apparently some people get passes even if they're on the opposing team. I remember asking my grade school teacher incredulously, why didn't the Confederate soldiers just shoot Clara if they wanted to win? Oh, little Anne, bless your heart. If the goal is to become a witch, you put on the green paint. If the goal is to be a champion speller, you memorize the words. If the goal is to win at kid games, you hone your hiding and listening and table slapping skills. But if you want to win a war, you can't just kill anyone. You can only kill certain people. Imagine what it sounds like to a kid who doesn't quite understand death or ethics or competition yet. It's okay to shoot, stab, or blow up with a cannon, but only if they're really bad people are standing up and are wearing a certain color. I mean, they taught us that war was wrong and war was bad, but sometimes you have to go to war if it's a good cause. So it's okay that chess or old maid or red light, green light has rules, but when it comes to good and evil, there shouldn't be rules. If you have to be bad to make things good happen, then you should be bad to make sure you win. Take out the nurses on the field, capture the villains, blow up the medic's tent and the supply tent and the food tent. I don't know, do what it takes to win. If you're gonna be bad to be good, be bad. It turns out that what I thought 
was war, was actually guerrilla warfare, and it turns out that guerrilla warfare is illegal. Do I sound stupid or unwoke or just really naive? Well, war is stupid. <laughs> Look at the story of Les Miserables, created for and centered on an historical event. Losing the lives of men and children and women for a six-day war that accomplished nothing. What a waste. Classmates whose dad missed their teenage years because of a war in the Middle East. An entire generation with PTSD because of Vietnam. People flying Confederate flags because they lost a war 200 years ago and they're still mad they can't own other people. War is unwoke. <laughs> it's okay to shoot, stab, and blow up people with a cannon, cannon, but only if they're standing up and wearing a certain color. Winning is important, but so is winning with dignity. It's always best to be the most courteous shooter in the group. There are rules in war. There is civility in war. And this is one of the many reasons I am anti-war. If we can be civil enough to not kill nurses and only kill men and women in costumes, then we can be civil enough to work out our problems without going to war. Right? Do you see why at a young age I thought war was stupid? In the original book, the stage musical, and the extremely mediocre film, Les Miserables, we follow the story of Jean Valjean. He stole a loaf of bread to help feed his sister's starving family. He is arrested, convicted, incarcerated, and escapes, rendering himself a criminal again. But after an encounter of pure grace, understanding, and forgiveness from a Catholic priest, Jean Valjean sets himself on the path of righteousness. In other words, he spends the rest of his life making things right. As Danny Kellogg mentioned last week in his sermon, Jean Valjean explains on his deathbed that to love another person is to see the face of God. And this experience is the antithesis of war, which teaches us we can dehumanize an entire nation, an entire race even, make them monsters in our heads. And in doing this, by God, we render ourselves capable of doing the unthinkable, slaughtering a fellow human. Victor Hugo, the man who wrote Les Mis, told his publisher, my book is for the republics that harbor slaves as well as empires that have serfs. Social problems go beyond frontiers. Humankind's wounds, those huge sores that litter the world, do not stop at the blue and red lines drawn on maps. Wherever men go in ignorance or despair, wherever women sell themselves for bread, wherever children lack a book to learn or a warm hearth, Les Miserables knocks at the door and says, open up, I am here for you. In act one, Jean Valjean becomes the adopted father of a girl he rescues from abusive innkeepers after her own mother died from the natural consequences of prostitution and starvation. In act two, in his final attempt to be a force for good in the world, Valjean is older. The girl is now a young woman in Paris in a love. She's in love with a man whose young friends convince him to participate in a revolution. <clears throat> in the aria, Bring Him Home, which most men sing completely in falsetto, conveying the utmost vulnerability of the character. Valjean prays to God to protect Marius, even if the cost for Marius's life requires Valjean's own life. Bring him home, he pleads to God. 
Instead, Valjean brings Marius home. Having stolen out to the barricade, Valjean finds everyone dead except Marius, who is wounded and unconscious. So the old man carries Marius through the sewers of Paris to make sure that Marius lives. When I was nine months pregnant, <laughs> I gave my final vocal performance two days before my child was born. It was the 10 year anniversary of a theater troupe I had founded on behalf of a Baptist church. Again, not all Baptists are Southern. You think it's hard convincing people there are good Christians in the world? Try convincing people there are good Baptists. Anyway, First Baptist Church of Austin, Texas had designated one fourth of their building's fourth floor and $60,000 to create a black box theater. It is still one of only of about 10 venues dedicated to theater in the city of Austin. 2017 was our 10 year anniversary. On Saturday evening, we held a cabaret fundraiser with five of the troupe's gorgeous performers tasked with choosing three to four musical theater songs that spoke to them over their careers as actors and people of faith. Because it was Halloween weekend, I went with the title Songs That Slay, playing on the darkness of the season, but also the metaphor of being slayed by something so profound. Some songs were funny, some were dramatic. For you theater lovers out there, we had Finishing the Hat from Sunday in the Park with George, No One is Alone from Into the Woods, Don't Rain on My Parade from Funny Girl, Who I'd Be from Shrek, Waving from a Window from Dear Evan Hansen. And for you theologians, Anna Carter Florence flew in to speak at a luncheon and she preached at church at our art and faith worship service Sunday morning. It was a weekend. It's no wonder my child was born two days later. The songs I selected to sing that encouraged me, freed me, affected me, rescued me, or reflected me included I Am What I Am from La Cage aux Folles, I Don't Know How to Love Him from Jesus Christ Superstar, and Bring Him Home from Les Mis. Pacifism is a big part of how I want to exist in this world. I want more from our governments than a civil, proper, rule-following game, where we brainwash ourselves to believe that the humans on the other side of the line are actually monsters so we can kill them. Literally. And now that I'm older and more educated, I certainly want more from our governments than guerrilla warfare, attacking civilians and unnecessary disruption of nature and humanity. Now, for anyone freaking out because this sounds like a political sermon, you should know that yes, I'm pro-veteran. Yes, I've read Bonhoeffer. And yes, I do believe that war is inevitable. But singing that song, was an expression of my belief and my hope that war is wrong. And singing it contextually, knowing the character is a father and that I was a mother with an infant in my belly was really an experience. Bring him home, I sang. Bring him out, bring him up, bring him in, bring him away from, bring him to. God, bring him to God. He that is a reflection of God. Pray for the best and show up in the worst. It's my pleasure and my struggle to do this every single day. Even if we live in a war-ridden world from Iraq to Ukraine to Niger to Afghanistan to Myanmar to Russia. Because I do not struggle alone. We must remember Les Mis. <laughs> we must remember the music, the books, the plays, the poems, the musicals, the sculptures, the paintings, the films, the sacred scriptures. These are the things I hum while I work. I repeat in my head, I hold in my heart, and I revisit in my sleep. We must remember that art informs, 
instructs, and invites us to use our imaginations. We must remember that someday swords will be turned into plowshares. Someday the lion will lay down with the lamb. God on high, hear my prayer in my need. You have always been there. You can take, you can give. Let him be, let him live. And if I die, let me die, let him live. Bring him home, bring him home. As our service draws to a close, we have one more stop to make at the table of communion. The table of God's dream where all are fed and all have a place to belong. You're invited to join us in this meal, either by using something you have at home to represent the bread and the cup, or you may simply join us in spirit today. Remember with me now the story of faith, how Jesus met with his disciples and took the bread, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to them saying, this is my body, my life lived for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we recall how after the meal, he took the cup and he poured out the wine and he gave it to them saying, this is the wine of the new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. And I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day I drink it with you in the kingdom of God's love. Now that we have shared in this sacred meal, let's join in saying together the prayer that scripture tells us Jesus taught to his own disciples. Our creator who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Kurt Vonnegut once wrote, If I should ever die, God forbid, let this be my epitaph. The only proof he needed for the existence of God was music. I hope that there is a melody of God's love that is stirring in your heart as you move into the days ahead. A melody, a tune that invites you to sing a new song of the world as it could be, centered in the grace of God, the love of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit for all people everywhere. Until we meet again, friends, go in peace. Amen. Sign up for our weekly email newsletter to keep up to date on all our ministry news. See the link in the description below today's video. Interested in becoming an online member of our faith community? Contact Pastor Brian to learn more. Our Blessing Box Outreach is always in need of non-perishable food to help feed those in need. Drop food donations at the church or give a monetary donation via the Tithely link below. 
This has been an online worship experience brought to you by First Christian of St. Joseph, Missouri and produced by online ministry coordinator Jason Jasper. Please see the description below today's video for important links and media attributions. First Christian. Where love comes first.